The Trial of St. Victoria of Carthage, Martyred for Illegal Worship Before we hear the trial itself, let us briefly reflect on the circumstances that led to this trial. St. Victoria and those with her were martyred in 304 during the reign of Emperor Diocletian, who had commanded all Christians, under pain of death, to deliver up the Holy Scriptures to be burnt. This persecution had raged a whole year in Africa. Some had betrayed the cause of religion, but many more had defended it with their blood when these saints were apprehended. Abatina, a city of the proconsular province of Africa, was the theater of their triumph. Saturninus, priest of that city, celebrated the divine mysteries on a Sunday in the house of Octavius Felix. The magistrates, having notice of it, came with a troop of soldiers and seized 49 persons of both sexes. The principal among them were the priest Saturninus with his four children, young Saturninus and Felix, both lectors, Mary, who had consecrated her virginity to God, and Hilarionus, yet a child. Also, Dativus, a noble senator, Ampelius, Rogatianus, and Victoria. Dativus, the ornament of the Senate of Abatina, whom God destined to be one of the principal senators of heaven, marched at the head of this holy troop. Saturninus walked by his side, surrounded by his illustrious family. The others followed in silence. Being brought before the magistrates, they confessed Jesus Christ so resolutely that their very judges applauded their courage, which repaired the infamous sacrilege committed there a little before by Fundanus, the bishop of Abatina, who in that same place had given up to the magistrates the sacred books to be burnt. But a violent shower suddenly falling put out the fire, and a prodigious hail ravaged the whole country. The confessors were shackled and sent to Carthage, the residence of the proconsul. They rejoiced to see themselves in chains for Christ, and sung hymns and canticles during their whole journey to Carthage, praising and thanking God. The proconsul, Annalinus, addressing himself first to Dativus, asked him of what condition he was, and if he had assisted at the assembly of the Christians. He answered that he was a Christian and had been present. The proconsul bid him discover who presided and in whose house those religious assemblies were held, but without waiting for his answer, commanded him to be put on the rack and torn with iron hooks to oblige him to a discovery. They underwent severely the tortures of the rack, iron hooks, and cudgels. The weaker sex fought no less gloriously, particularly the illustrious Victoria, who, being converted to Christ in her tender years, had signified a desire of leading a single life, which her pagan parents would not agree to, having promised her in marriage to a rich young nobleman. Victoria, on the day appointed for her wedding, full of confidence in the protection of him whom she had chosen for the only spouse of her soul, leapt out of a window and was miraculously preserved from injury. Having made her escape, she took shelter in a church, after which she consecrated her virginity to God with the ceremonies then used on such occasions at Carthage, in Italy, Gaul, and all over the West. To the crown of virginity, she earnestly desired to join that of martyrdom. The proconsul, on account of her quality, and for the sake of her brother, a pagan, tried all means to prevail with her to renounce her faith. The following is the account of her trial and her triumphant witness for Christ. After making their way in chains through the crowds of people, they arrive at the criminal court. A certain Felix, a not unkindly man, takes the opportunity to try to dissuade them. What harm is there in saying, Caesar's Lord, 
and offering incense and saving your life. At first, he receives no reply, but, upon his insisting, Victoria answers, I do not intend to follow your advice. This is said so decisively that Felix realizes the futility of further argument and is about to enter the court when a young man presses through the crowd. It is Fortunation, Victoria's brother, who, to her distress, shares her parents' antagonism to her religion. Have pity on yourself, Victoria, he calls, in agitation, and on your parents. My Lord Jesus told us that he who loved father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Give up this silly superstition. Do you see that water pot or whatever it is? asks Victoria, pointing to a large amphora outside a shop. I see it. Can it be called by any other name than what it is? No. So also I cannot call myself anything but what I am, a Christian. Think of your youth, pleads Fortunation. Your exhortation is cruel mockery. With this cryptic reply, Victoria mounts the steps and is taken with her fellow prisoners into a side chamber where they must await trial. They are summoned in turn to the courtroom, Saturninus going first, and after what seems only a short time, Victoria is called for cross-examination. The proconsul, Annalinus, is seated on a lofty throne at the far end of the hall. His twelve lictors are standing around him, together with his assessors, attendants, and secretaries with their wax tablets and pencils. Victoria is brought to the bar by two soldiers and stands quietly waiting while the clerk of the court reports that she is charged with having been present at a Christian assembly contrary to the imperial edict. Annalinus asks, What is your name? Victoria responds, I am a Christian. Stop that impious language and say what your name is. I am a Christian. Annalinus to the soldiers guarding her. Hit her on the mouth and say to her, Do not give crooked answers. My first and chosen name is a Christian, but if you ask my secular name, it is Victoria. What is your condition? I am a slave. Annalinus to the clerk of the court. Is this true? The clerk responds, No, sir. Annalinus continues, Whose slave are you? I am a slave of Christ. Who are your parents? Christ is my true father and faith is my mother. My earthly parents are away from the city. To what country do you belong? I was born in Carthage. What is your profession? I am a consecrated virgin. Explain yourself. I am a Christian and have taken a vow not to marry that I may devote myself to the service of my Lord. Then you have no children? Yes, many, by God's mercy. An assessor interjects, That is a Christian way of speaking. She means she has children according to the faith. Annalinus continues, Why did you tell me a lie and say you had children? Do you wish me to show that I speak the truth and not a lie? I have children according to God in many parts of the city. You are speaking like a person who has lost possession of her faculties. The Lord Jesus, whom I have received into my inmost parts, has possession of me and speaks by me. Of course, you know the commands of the emperor that all must worship the gods who govern all things so I recommend you to agree to sacrifice. I am a Christian. I worship Christ, the Son of God, who came in the latter times for our salvation and delivered us from the deceit of the devil. But to such idols as these I do not sacrifice. Do what you please. It is impossible for me to sacrifice to false and unreal devils, for those who sacrifice to them are like them. For as the true worshippers according to the divine instruction of the Lord, those who worship God in spirit and in truth become like to the glory of God and are with Him immortal, 
sharing eternal life through the word, so that those who serve these become like the devils in their unreality, and are with them destroyed in hell. For just vengeance is taken of him who deceived man, the noblest creature of God, I mean the devil, who by his wickedness stirs men up to this. So know, proconsul, that I do not sacrifice to these. Sacrifice to the gods and be a fool no longer. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish. You must sacrifice. The emperor has commanded it. The living do not sacrifice to the dead. Do you think the gods are dead? Do you wish to be told? These gods were never even live men that they should die. Do you wish to learn that this is true? Deprive them of the honor which you think to offer to them, and you will know that they are nothing. They are but earthly material, and in time they perish. Our God is above time. He made the ages. He himself abides immortal and eternal, the same forever, without increase or decrease. But these gods are made by men, and, as I said, are destroyed by time. Do not wonder that they utter oracles and deceive, for the devil, who fell of old from his glorious estate, in his own wickedness seeks to frustrate the fatherly love of God to man, and being hard-pressed by the saints, he fights against them and prepares war against them, and foretells the same to his own and in like manner arguing from the things that happen to us day by day, being more ancient than we are in age. His experience teaches him to predict the future mischief, which he means to do. For by his denial of God he has gained a knowledge of unrighteousness, and God allows him to tempt men, and to seek to draw them away from godliness. Believe me, therefore, sir, that your position is a very false one. You ought to love your sovereign, seeing that you enjoy the advantages of the Roman laws. Who is there that loves the emperor as much as Christians do? We pray for him constantly from year's end to year's end, that he may live long, may govern his subject people with justice, and may have peace throughout his reign. We pray also for the preservation of his armies, and for the good estate of the wide world. I am glad that you do, but in order that the emperor may the better recognize your loyalty, join us in offering a sacrifice to him. I pray to my Lord, who is great and true for the health of the emperor, but I may not sacrifice to the emperor, and he ought never to demand it. Who would think of sacrificing to a human being? Sacrifice or die! That is why the Dalmatian highwaymen say, they give the traveler that choice, your money or your life. No one that they catch asks what is fair and reasonable, but only what force his captor can command. It is the same with you. You tell us that we must either do what is wrong or perish. Justice punishes crime. If I have been guilty of any such, I condemn my own self without waiting for your sentences. But if I am led to punishment for worshiping the true God, then it is not the law that condemns me, but the arbitrary will of a judge. My commission is to enforce the edict. If, therefore, you show contempt, you must prepare for certain punishment. And I am commanded never to deny God. If you serve a frail man of flesh who must soon depart from this world and be food for worms? How much more ought I to obey the most mighty God, whose power endureth forever? He has himself said, Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. There, I always wanted to know that. You have just confessed the mistake of your persuasion and of your law. God has a son, then. Yes. What is God's Son? The Word of Truth and Grace. Is that His name? 
You did not ask me about his name, but about his powers. Tell me his name. He is called Jesus Christ, who was God's wife who bore him this son. The process of earthly birth are far from our ideas of the Godhead. Our scriptures say, My heart has brought forth a good word. The Son of God, the word of truth, was produced from the heart of God. God has a body then. He alone knows. We have no knowledge of invisible form. We can only reverence his power and might. If God has no body, he cannot have a heart. There is no such thing as perception without organs. Wisdom is not the product of bodily organs. It is the gift of God. A body is not necessary for thought. I will listen to you no longer. Unless you are prepared to sacrifice, I will send you to a brothel. I think that you must know that the Lord has regard to men's wills. God sees the chastity of the intention. If you compel me to this, it is no sin of mine, but a thing violently afflicted upon me. Do not bring shame upon your family. It is a disgrace that will never be forgotten. Christ will know how to preserve his own. Slap her sharply with the palms of your hands and say, Do not be a fool, but sacrifice to the gods. Fortination, who has pressed forward to the front of the court. Sir, may I be permitted to speak? Annalinus asks, Who is this man? The clerk responds, The barrister Fortination, sir. He is the brother of the accused. Annalinus responds, He is permitted to speak. Fortination continues, My sister is not responsible for her accusation, sir. She was persuaded to this in the absence of her parents and while I myself was engaged in study. Victoria replies, I have not been persuaded. I can produce witnesses to prove this. All that I have done is of my own free will and choice. She has been driven out of her mind with subtle arguments. This is my mind. I have never changed it. Annalinus interjects, Will you go with your brother Fortunation? Victoria responds, No, I am a Christian and my brethren are those who keep the commandments of God. Think what is for your good. You see your brother wants to provide for your safety. I have told you my mind. You were present at this assembly? Yes. Why did you celebrate the Eucharist, contrary to the imperial edict? We cannot do without the Eucharist. It is a foolish question, as if anyone could be a Christian without the Eucharist. As there can be no Eucharist without Christians, so there can be no Christians without the Eucharist. It is the hope and salvation of Christians. I was at the service and celebrated it with the brethren, for I am a Christian. Give the names of your other associates. Their names are written in the heavenly book and in the pages of God. It is not for mortal eyes to behold what has been inscribed by the immortal and invisible power of God. Who was it that put these ideas into your head? Almighty God. What people were those who prevailed on you to take up this folly? Almighty God and His only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Sacrifice! No. Would you like time to consider? In such a straightforward matter, there is no need to think. Do you realize that I have power to torture you? My God is greater than you, so I am not afraid of your threats. He will enable me to endure whatever you inflict upon me. Knock her mouth with stones and say, Cease your folly! Then two torturers stripped except for tunics step forward. One seizes Victoria by the hair, forcing her head back. The other breaks her teeth with a stone at the proconsul's command. Victoria says, My God, which is and endureth forever, ordained that I should be born. He gave me salvation by the saving waters of baptism. He is with me to help me and to strengthen his handmaid, 
not to commit sacrilege. Hang her up on the rack by her thumbs and put weights on her feet. I am a Christian. Change your mind. What desperation is this? It is no desperation. It is the fear of the living God. Many others have sacrificed, and they are alive and in their right mind. I cannot sacrifice. I entreat you to consider a little with yourself and change your mind. Not I, sir. Why are you so bent on death? Not upon death, but upon life. You are so bent on death that you make nothing of it. Sometimes when men are prosecuted for quite a small sum of money, they will brave death with the wild beasts. You are like those men. I enjoy life, but love of life does not make me afraid to die. There is nothing better than life, the life eternal, which gives immortality to the soul which has lived well. Sacrifice! I will not. Why not? Because the sacred and divine scriptures say, He that sacrificeth unto any god, save unto God only, he shall be utterly destroyed. Then sacrifice to God only. God does not desire such sacrifices. The scriptures say, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of lambs and I delight not in the blood of he-goats. Offer me no fine flour. An assessor interjects, Has fine flour anything to do with your case? Are you not pleading for your life? Annalinus continues, What sacrifice does God delight in? God delights in a clean heart, and in pure thoughts, and in the sacrifice of true speech. Did not Paul offer sacrifice? God forbid, nor Moses. Only the Jews were commanded to sacrifice, to none but God, and only at Jerusalem. The Jews do wrong now by celebrating their rites in other places. Heat some sharp nails and pierce her hands with them. Glory to thee, O Lord Jesus Christ, that thou hast vouchsafed to allow my hands to be nailed for thy name's sake. You are in such a hurry to die because you think you will suffer for a praiseworthy object. If I am permitted to suffer thus, everlasting glory will await me. If you were suffering for your country and for the laws, you would have everlasting praise. It is indeed for the laws I suffer, but for the laws of God. Laws which were bequeathed to you by a dead man who was crucified. See what a fool you are to make more of a dead man than of the live emperor. He died for our sins, that he might bestow upon us eternal life. But he is God who endureth forever, and whosoever confesses him shall have eternal life, and whosoever denies him everlasting punishment. I am sorry for you, and advise you to sacrifice and live with us. If I live with you, it is death to me but if I die, I live. Scrape her sides. A torturer, as he takes the iron claw to rip open her breasts and sides. Before your body is marred, take my advice, you poor woman. Spare yourself. I have within me the God whom I serve through Jesus Christ. Fool! Do you not know that he whom you are calling on was a man who under the authority of a governor called Pontius Pilate, was fastened to the cross for his crimes? Records of it are preserved. Christ is God. What makes you think he is a God? He made the blind see. He cleansed the lepers, raised the dead, restored to speech the dumb, and healed many sicknesses. A woman with an issue of blood touched the hem of his garment and was made whole. After his own death he rose again, and he did many other signs and wonders besides these. And God was crucified, was he? He was crucified for our salvation. He knew that he should be crucified and suffer shame, and freely gave himself to endure all for us. The holy scriptures had foretold these things concerning him, the scriptures which the Jews think they hold, but do not. 
scrape. Lord, they are writing that thou art mine. This is only the beginning. Sacrifice and spare yourself. Don't think to terrify me with words. I am ready for you at every point. I wear the armor of God. Thrice accursed creature, what armor do you wear? You are naked and all over wounds. You do not know these things. You cannot see my defense. You are blind. Have compassion on yourself and sacrifice to the gods. The best compassion I can show myself is to confess unwaveringly our Lord Jesus Christ, the true judge, who shall come to try the deeds of all men. Put strong vinegar mixed with salt up her nostrils. Your vinegar is sweet, and your salt has lost its saltiness. Mix mustard and vinegar, and pour it into her nostrils. Your officers are deceiving you. They gave me honey instead of vinegar. You are proud. Pride is one thing and firmness is another. I speak firmly, but not proudly. What makes you smile? I saw the glory of the Lord and was glad. Lash her with thongs. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Turn her over and beat her on the belly. Lord, help thy servant. As you beat her, say, Christian woman, where is your helper? He has helped me and helps me still. Rub her sides and breasts well with salt. You must rub in more salt than that if I am to keep. You will keep just as long as the execution and no longer. Thanks be to God. Today I shall be in heaven. Annalinus writes on a tablet and hands it to the clerk of the court. The clerk, reading, Victoria, having confessed herself a Christian and having admitted attendance at an unlawful assembly, since after opportunity offered her of returning to the custom of the Romans, she has obstinately persisted. My sentence is that she shall be given to the beasts. Victoria responds, Present my thanks to the emperor, for he has made me a joint heir with Christ. Victoria is taken down from the rack and carried to the nearby prison, where she is to await her final testing in the amphitheater. Victoria would be victorious in the amphitheater, receiving the crown of martyrdom from our Lord Jesus Christ. She is commemorated on February 11th. O holy martyr Victoria, pray to God for us.